Hey, this is Pastor Nick Gillespie from the Grace Baptist Church. Thank you for tuning in to our Bible study series on the Gospels. I hope you enjoy it. I hope it's an encouragement. I'll see you at the end of the video. All right, got the answer. All right, um, we're going to take a small shift uh, sideways. I'm still talking about the Gospels. But however, we're going to maybe jump into the, uh, we're going to get to the Sermon on the Mount. Said something last week, got a couple looks while I said it. So, hey, we're going to cover real quick. I want to talk to you about the kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of God. Because there is a difference. And uh, we'll bring some stuff up here. Um, this is a topic that kind of uh, intrigued me a little bit. Because, you know, why would there some places in the Bible say kingdom of God? Why would some say kingdom of heaven? And um, as you know, I've talked about this before. That there's a pastor that I went out soul winning one time. And I asked him, he's like, well, I really just don't think it matters. Okay, that's... Now, you may think it doesn't matter, but it's not, you're not going to be, you know, come out and say it. Uh, but there is a difference. And as we go through the Sermon on the Mount, it's something I think you ought to at least be aware of. It's not something you have to master, but it's something you need to be aware of. Um, so there's passages of Scripture that if we don't at least have a marginal understanding of this very topic, that we're going to miss out on stuff, we're going to try to wedge things into Scripture that don't fit, we're going to start thinking that salvation is by works instead of grace. But kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are not the same thing. As we, in our first lesson, we mentioned that Matthew is the only gospel to mention the kingdom of heaven. Everywhere else it's the kingdom of God. Matthew is written to the Jews and has a little bit of the millennium in mind. Uh, matter of fact, we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute too. Because remember the parable of the ten virgins? People try to say, well, they didn't have their, five didn't have their lamps, you know, or didn't have the oil for lamps. They weren't saved. No, no. Um, so Mark and Luke use kingdom of God. Matthew uses kingdom of God, kingdom of God a couple times. Um, but that alone should tell us they're not interchangeable. They're not the same. So let's go to John chapter 3, if you would, please. Now on this, I didn't put everything up on the screen. However, I put some of them. So we may have to do some flipping. We may not have, I can read them all to you if you don't want to flip. All right, so John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, they accept a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, if it said, you accept to be born again, cannot see the kingdom of heaven, that would be a problem. But it doesn't. It says kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it, take it by force. What's that talking about? Is there really some angels up there? You know, is heaven really suffering violence? Just that one verse right there ought to give us pause and realize, you know what, that's not talking about heaven. A couple points here. Heaven is an immaterial place, Right? It is somewhere, but it's outside of our three dimensions. So that right there, it's spiritual, but yet there's still a physical aspect. But however, time, space, and width isn't a factor. I have no idea what it's going to look like. I don't know how we're going to perceive it. I don't know if, you know, because if we look at something in fourth dimension, you're going to see the you're going to see the backside of everything on the third. Because remember, in the, in the third, we see the sides of all the of, of the second. We actually see all sides of the second. In the second, we see all sides of the first. So in the fourth, you'd see all five sides of the third. I don't understand once you get beyond that, the different things. So all that being said, heaven, as we know it, is a material thing. Everything within our atmosphere, oxygen, nitrogen, the earth, carbon, all the different elements that are within our planet, these are physical things. All right. But right there, that tells you, suffer the violence and the violent take it by force. You can't explain that without, I mean, you just try to wedge something in there. Without understanding this topic, you'll try to wedge something stupid in there. Um, but will Christians be cast into out of darkness at any point? No. Right? So let's go over there and look at that. Matthew chapter 8, look at verses 11 and 12. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac in the kingdom of heaven. So that's talking about on earth. So right there is talking about the millennium. So look at verse 12. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What in the world are we talking about? Because how can you be a child of the kingdom and the kingdom of heaven 
And there's a kingdom of heaven, but yet you're children of the kingdom, but you're cast out. What's the kingdom in chapter 12 and verse 12? It makes no sense without understanding this. As I say here before you, I can tell you, verse 11 is talking about the kingdom of heaven, it's talking about the millennium. We're going to sit down with Abraham, we're going to sit down with Isaac. Now we're going to have a couple chit chats, you know, hey, Abraham, Abraham, what were you thinking on this, you know? And, uh, you know, as he probably backhand you for, you know, disrespecting him. Understandable. And um, we really just could have said no to Hagar and this whole thing would have been a lot different. Uh, but, you know, then, yeah, no, I'm not going to say anything bad to Abraham and I doubt you will either. So when it then goes down here, it says about the children of the kingdom, that kingdom now isn't talking about kingdom of God. That is talking about the Jewish kingdom, right? So what it's telling us is, because we know the millennium's a Jewish kingdom, but we get to go there through salvation. We are adopted into the level of the Jews. So millennium, we all go to the millennium. But Jesus is going to reign on whose throne? Really? No one? Gavin, go ahead and say it. David, the throne of David. So David's throne is the is a Jewish throne. So it's a Jewish kingdom. That's what adoption means. We're adopted to their level when it comes to the millennium. So children of the kingdom, though, is the Jewish kingdom on earth, but they didn't get saved, so they never entered the kingdom of God, so they don't get to be part of the kingdom of heaven. Does that make a little bit of sense there? Okay. Because um, when you just read that straight without understanding what kingdom of heaven is talking about, but we're still going to do more and we're going to prove it. So we wedge in teachings that just don't fit. Kingdoms, the word kingdoms, or kingdom, are used 399 times in the Bible, 163 times in the New Testament. Kingdom of God is used 70 times. Kingdom of heaven, half of that at 33, which makes sense because it's only in Matthew. Let's hear Matthew chapter 6. Uh, Look you there. I forgot to put that up there. All right, Matthew chapter 6. Look at verses 9 through 13. This will be in the Sermon on the Mount. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, it's because it's interesting. You see heaven there, you know it's talking about that place out there, outside of our dimensions. But yet when it's talking about kingdom of heaven, it's not talking about that. So just keep it straight. Thy kingdom come. What kingdom is that talking about? Kingdom of God. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Because it's when it's done on earth, that's the kingdom of heaven. But as in heaven, it's talking about the heaven where God dwells. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine, thine, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So let's talk about thine is the kingdom. So what we have is we have the kingdom of God. It's everything. The kingdom of heaven is within the kingdom of God. The, the, the different kingdoms we have are within the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God's the big, old, you know, you can still be unsaved, but you're still in the kingdom of God. But yet the kingdom of God still lives inside of you. So explain that. Uh, but it's not the kingdom of heaven never lives inside of you. We live inside the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> so the Bible, we must understand this, is a book of kingdoms. Uh, it has a beginning from the beginning. It's a book of kingdoms. It's uh, you know from creation, Israel, spiritual, the final kingdom, the struggle, everything that we're going to talk about. Everything's within, within kingdoms. And the more we understand that, the better we'll understand our Bibles, especially when we get to Revelation. Well, let's go ahead and head there. Matter of fact, Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he, he shall reign forever and ever. So then that's all the earthly kingdoms. You know, the United States is a kingdom, right? You know, these different kingdoms, maybe a president dump or whatever the case is, but they're all kingdoms. So Jesus and both John the Baptist said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then after John the Baptist's death, it's never mentioned again, but only kingdom of God is mentioned. I'll show you this right here. So this is the canopy theory going backwards. And I put that in air quotes because if you go Google what's canopy theory, I don't know what you're going to find. I just believe that there was a canopy of water around the earth when it was when it was created. Uh, well, actually... God created the canopy on day two. Uh, dry land on day three. Is that right, Brandon? <laughs> oh. Day one was light. Day two was 
firmament, day three was land, day four was plants. Yes, okay. So, but also remember on day three, it wasn't, you know, remember the earth was revealed. I just, it's just interesting. Uh, it doesn't say it was created yet right at that time. So, but what you see here is you see the water canopy. And so in my opinion, when it's talking about kingdom of heaven, it's talking about everything inside of this, even though we don't have water canopy anymore. Everything inside of this is kingdom of heaven. The earth is the kingdom of heaven. And then the Bible makes so much more sense when you understand that. Because the millennium will be on earth. Let's go ahead and head over here. Oh, man. Let's go ahead and cover the different kingdoms. Wasn't ready for that. So first we have the kingdom of God. That would be everything. Everything fits underneath it. But yet it's it's like the force. It's like a mini chlorian. It's over everything. It's inside everything. Uh, if you don't know what a mini chlorian is, you're probably better off. Uh, but kingdom of God, that's, you know, kingdom of God lives inside of us. The kingdom of God is what we live in. Kingdom of God. Then we have Satan's kingdom. Technically, the earth is Satan's kingdom right now. We can argue the point all day, but it's technically his. Kingdom of heaven is the earth. We have the Gentile kingdoms. That's us. We have the kingdom of Israel. And so when we look back at uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 13, when it says children of the kingdom, it's talking about kingdom number five. And then number six, we're talking about the Antichrist kingdom, which is only 1,420 days long. Well, no, times two. Eh, it could be either. It's either um, 36, 42 months or 84 months. It depends how you divide out the uh, 70. But then you have Christ's kingdom, which is hard to differentiate from kingdom of heaven. But Christ's kingdom will be the millennium. But kingdom of heaven is still on earth right now because it's everything on earth. Christ's kingdom, though, will be the millennium. And then you have the Father's kingdom, uh, which is mentioned a lot less, but still everything fits within that. Kingdom of God, Father's kingdom, not much to differentiate, but Christ's kingdom of itself is just talking about the millennium. Kingdom of heaven is talking about earth, and it also includes the millennium. Does all that make sense? I should have been going off my notes. I was not on that. Um, kingdom of God, everywhere, eternal, everything, spiritual, physical, Satan's kingdom, fell cast to earth, kingdom of heaven. Okay, the, I'm going to go over my notes and I'll make sure that we catch this. Adam was given dominion over the kingdom of heaven, right? It's yours. Dwell, be over it, you have dominion. So Adam has been the only person to be over the entire kingdom of heaven. However, other people have tried. Some people have come close. Alexander the Great came close. Jesus Khan, if you want to sound like, uh, what was that guy's name? John Kerry used to say it. Genghis Khan came close. But you know who's going to succeed? The Antichrist. The Antichrist will be over the kingdom of heaven. He will, he will conquer it all. Now, the kingdom of heaven right now is technically Satan's kingdom. Right? We know this. And so even when it's the Antichrist kingdom, number six, during the tribulation, it's still Satan's kingdom and it's still the kingdom of heaven. All Gentile kingdoms will submit them to the Antichrist kingdom. It won't be Christ and it won't be the fathers, but it still won't fit underneath the kingdom of God. Man, that makes a lot of sense. So, heaven is physical here. It's the air, kingdom of heaven, dominion. Uh, let's see if I put that verse there. Okay, so kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, linked to the invisible God, linked to the visible heavens. You see there includes angels and spirits. Kingdom of heaven is mankind only. Kingdom of God is eternal. Kingdom of heaven has a beginning. Kingdom of God is unassailable. Can't, in other words, you can't take it over, which can be taken by force. Just the fact that verse kingdom of heaven is taken by force, talking about war. God opens the door. Man can shut the door. Um, contains only the righteous kingdom of God. Yeah, contains sinner and Satan on the kingdom of heaven. But remember, contains, but also we get it that only the unrighteous still live within it in the meantime. Um, kingdom of God is personal and individual, and the kingdom of heaven is corporate and institutional. And so with a little bit of nuance there, I get that. Don't, don't get too hung up on a little change to words that I have there. Um, and look, I forgot to put Genesis 1. Why do I have... Oh, man, I'm so far ahead of my notes. All right, so Gentile kingdoms going backwards. That's uh, Genesis 10 on. 
Uh, Antichrist's kingdom, by the way, is the ten different kingdoms, the toes of the, the ten toes of the beast. I don't need to spend a long time on that. And the Father's kingdom will technically then just be new heaven, new earth, final eternity. See, that's what happens when you study and you get ahead of yourself, you don't look at your notes. So a group tends to have, and all of you will see this, a group tends to have somebody who wants to step up and be a dictator in it. Latter Church has nothing like that, but I see it over on the American Legion side all the time. I had, uh, we had lunch today with uh, the manager and one other guy from uh, the uh, American Legion baseball team, Eugene Challengers. We're their sponsoring post. I've never talked to them. And uh, so we had lunch today. He's, you know, telling us about the history, you know, back in the 80s, you know, because why are we the sponsor? We're the Springfield post. There's two posts in Eugene. Well, he's like, well, we tried to get 83 to sponsor us. They flat out rejected it. Why? Maybe they thought we're asking for money. So they then came to us, and at some point in the 80s, we said, yeah, we'll do it. And uh, so we're their sponsor. Now, uh, I've kind of volunteered. I have to carry a flag out to the field sometime this uh, this season and be the poster veteran for them, but yeah, it's a small price to pay. Um, but so a kingdom tends to have an El Guapo. If you don't know who El Guapo is, that's from uh, the Three Amigos. Remember the guy who just absolutely has to run everything and has a tight fist and, uh, you know, get out of line, they shoot you. There's those power-hungry people all over the place. Adolf Hitler tried to be that guy. Adolf Hitler tried to take over the kingdom. And, you know, had he maybe played his cards a little different, the axis of evil probably could have pulled it off. Um, if it wasn't, you know, it's always killed, you know, if I've owned German cars, it takes double the amount of oil than anything else that I've ever owned. You think they were one from World War II? Because they had enough oil, they probably could have kept going. If they had enough oil, they wouldn't have attacked Russia. You know, just a bunch of stupid decisions they made, but you know, his goal was earth domination and to have dominion over the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> so they tend to have an El Guapo, they have people who seek power, they have people who attack, they have people that people have armies. You know, you may sit up one day and say, you know what, why are there any armies on the planet? Let's all just decide to be peaceful. Let's sign some arms treaties, get rid of nuclear, you know, nuclear weapons. That all sounds well and good. Do you believe that we'd get rid of them all? Not for smart. <laughs> but if we did, you know, there's going to be somebody that develops it somewhere and we're not going to have a deterrent. So we have to, you know, even for a peace, we still need to spend money on military because the best offense is a good defense. Yes. I don't know if there's agreement on that statement back there in the second row or third row. But, uh, you know, it, if you know that the end game is complete and total annihilation for both sides, you're not going to push the button. Okay. But if we go to Jeremiah 15, see, now I'm just chasing rabbit tricks. You get to Jeremiah 50, you get to Jeremiah 51, come to find out somebody does push the button. There will be nuclear war before this whole thing's over. I'm just not sure when. Will it be before the tribulation? During? You know, somewhere at that point, there will be a nuclear war at some point. You know, Jer Revelation 18 makes it pretty clear. It'll stand off from the destruction. Babylon will be destroyed, and all the, all the ship, pe shipping people will cry in the distance because they've lost their money. And uh, so it really sounds to me, Jeremiah 50, 51, that America will be destroyed. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12 again. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force, talking about Roman leaders, right? So we all know about this. John the Baptist dies and the whole thing changes. We had plan A before, talked about that last week. Now we have plan B. And so as we switch into plan B, it's now the destruction of the Jewish kingdom. And now the church is going to be run through Gentiles. So with the rejection of John the Baptist, when they behead him, now the shit switching over to the Gentile kingdoms, and so now the Romans are coming in and the whole, the whole history of the world is changing because of the beheading of John the Baptist. And so now the Romans are starting to be a more definitive presence. They're going to crucify a national leader in Jesus Christ. They're going to eventually, 30 years in the grand scheme of the whole thing, in 30 years they're going to come back. They're going to besiege Jerusalem for a while. And then AD 70, they're going to destroy it completely except for a couple walls. The violent taketh it by force. That's talking about Jerusalem. It's talking about, I mean, it's 
once you, once you read that, you know that, you got it. <clears throat> I already read 11, 12. Don't have it on my notes again. 8, 12. Okay, let's go to John 3. There it is. All right, let's watch this. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. Remember, John does not mention the kingdom of heaven, only mentions the kingdom of God. Jesus answered and said to him, verily, speaking of Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say to thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so here, although we know the kingdom of God is a little universal, here it's being a little bit more specific. The kingdom of God is talking about heaven. Nicodemus saith unto him, uh, How can a man be born when he is old? He, he, can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say to thee, except a man be born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So now it's a more specific thing. Kingdom of God is a broad term, but Jesus now brings it back in this instance to a very narrow thing. I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus here narrows down the kingdom of God to going through him. So here it's talking about heaven. It is not talking about anything else. But however, if you do believe on him, you enter the kingdom of God, but now you also get to be part of the kingdom of heaven in the millennium. After we die, we get to be brought back for that. Let me explain that in a minute too. What do we have next? John, Matthew chapter 7, look at verse 21 through 23. Now everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. See, we use this to talk about heaven, although it is still about, it still means in heaven as well. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Then I'll profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So the work in iniquity, but the thing is, they never got known. The kingdom of heaven, still talking about the millennium. So you're not going to get the millennium if you don't believe. And here, again, uh, people get a bit out of shape on this, but it's talking about work salvation. Work salvation is not how we do it. Look at verse 22. Uh, have we not prophesied in thy name? Imagine being a preacher of Jesus Christ, but yet going to hell when you die. In thy name have cast out devils. Imagine casting out a devil, but still going to hell when you die. And thy name done many wonderful works. Imagine doing that and still going to hell when you die. Um, just not something we want uh, We want going on here, obviously. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13, verse 37 through 43. All right. <clears throat> just kidding. Looking forward to getting to 25. All right. 13. Ready? Oh, sorry. He answered and said to them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. Uh, the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. Right there. So it's not about Jews. But the tares are the children. I'm sorry. That's not talking about the children of the kingdom. Kingdom of heaven. I'm sorry. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. I'm so sorry. I misspoke there for a second. The enemy that soweth them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. And Jesus is just breaking down his uh, uh, parable and so <laughs> 40. As therefore the tares, tares by the way means weeds, are gathered and, and uh, burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and, and them which do iniquity. Which kingdom is that talking about? <coughs> and shall cast into a furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as a sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let them hear. So what Jesus is talking about is two different kingdoms here. Kingdom of the Father, talking about heaven. Kingdom of heaven, talking about the millennium. There's still going to be people during the millennium who are sinning. I'm going to prove that to you. I have a drawing here that's going to help. Matter of fact, yeah. Okay, so it's here. All right. So the parable that we just talked about, if you don't catch this explanation, that's going to be fine. And if you even can see this, so point out some couple things here. Okay, so right, this is a timeline of the end of the world. So right here, you have the rapture. And if you can't see it, I'm sorry, you can move closer if you want. And I can also email you this PDF. Here's the rapture. And so then here, then, is Jacob's trouble, the beginning of sorrows. And this is the tribulation. The great tribulation is technically only three and a half years, 42 months. Or 1,260 days? Is that what that says? And so the last three and a half years is technically the only thing that's tribulation. We call the whole thing tribulation, but then that throws people off because, you know, this first three and a half years is going to be very peaceful. The rapture is going to hit. 
you're going to be gone. Homeless is, homelessness is fixed overnight. You pesky Christians that are out here judging me. I can now live whatever life I want. Wait, this house is empty because the inhabitants, the Christian inhabitants, got raptured out. Let's go take their house. And now everybody's going to be squatting. All our problems are going to be solved. Imagine if, you know, just all of a sudden, how many percent of the population do you think is saved? I know Matt would put a very low number. I'd say 40. What are you going to say? Less than 10. Are you talking about U.S. or are you talking about worldwide? Okay, I'll go, yeah, I'll go with that. I, I can agree with that. I'm just talking U.S. only, but yeah, I can go with that number. Uh, it means we're failing horribly, but yes. And so, rapture. Now, there's going to be such a time of peace here that when the Bible talks about it, you'll hear wars and rumors of wars. You always hear wars and rumors of wars. Right now, there's wars and rumors of wars. So does that mean the rapture is about to happen? No. That's what's going to happen right here. Because there's going to be such peace under the Antichrist that wars and rumors of wars now is something. Because the whole world, the kingdom of heaven, is going to be united under this guy. So much so, they're going to build a temple, a Jewish temple next to the uh, mosque that's in Jerusalem. Or they may tear it on the mosque and put up the... Imagine that. Either way, peace. So right there is where you have that peace. And you'd have to go through my Revelation study to understand some of this stuff. That Revelation is cyclical. So just understand that. So, see this right here? That's Matthew 24, 25. There you have the gleanings. You have the two witnesses being raptured up. There, here's a rapture. Here's a rapture with two people. Here's a rapture with uh, the thousands of people who will be saved during the tribulation because people will be saved. And so this bar right here, Matthew 24 and 25, if you read Matthew 24 and 25, you're not going to understand it properly unless you understand the kingdom of heaven. And I got 10 minutes to go over Matthew 24 and 25, and we're going to do it quick. Notice it goes over into the millennium. Millennium. Definitely in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus Christ will rule on the rule from Jerusalem on the throne of David. During that time, Satan will be bound and be loosed at the end of it. Y'all understand this? At least the gist. Matthew 24 and 25 is during the last part of the tribulation and goes into the millennium. I can explain that further some other time. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick this up at Matthew 25. And remember, Matthew 25 is all answering the question. Remember, the disciples asked Jesus, when will these things be and what is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? The rapture is not the end of the world. The rapture is over here. The rapture is not the end of the world. The end of the world is over here. Okay? The end of the world as we know. Who's that? Monkeys? Aria. Aria. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, they're also losing their religion though, so... Um, but over here, so you have the millennium. Here you have Armageddon. People believe that Armageddon, everyone dies, but it isn't. Everybody around Judea dies. Armageddon is not a nuclear war. Armageddon is Jesus riding back on his horse and a bunch of people following. He's going to speak and millions are going to die around Jerusalem. Because remember, the armies are going to surround Jerusalem and invade. It's Armageddon. Megiddo is where they're going to meet and come together to come attack. And how that's going to work, I don't know. I mean, are there going to be horses brought back? Is it going to be the horse's bridle? Doesn't mean they're all on horses. just means that's a measurement. So I guess there only has to be one horse for that. All right. So let's look at Matthew 24. Let's actually just look at 25 and look at these two parables. Because you look at these two parables, it doesn't make sense unless you understand this. You try to cram something in that's not there. All right. Matthew 25, let's look at verse 6. And at midnight there was a cry made. This is the uh, parable of the uh, of the wise virgins. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out and meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, Say, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And they went to buy, and the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Is this on here? I'm sorry. Okay. And the door was shut. That's verse 10. Okay, here's the question for you. Let's talk about the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes in the Bible, the, the Holy Spirit is typified or pictured by oil. So it throws people off when they read this. 
So then the ten virgins, they tell you, well, then five were saved and five weren't because of the oil. But there's an obvious problem with that, right? Okay, so watch this. Afterward came, verse 11, Afterward came also uh, the other virgin, saying, Lord, open to us. They answered and said, Verily I say to you, I know you not. Watch ye therefore, you, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Okay, so here's how we explain it. The ten virgins are not five saved or five unsaved. You know why? Because they're talking about the virgins. Where's the bride in this whole scenario? Does this, is this guy marrying ten women? No. These are attendants. These are people who are attending it. These might be bridesmaids. The bride is inside the church. The bride was never outside in the first place. Why would the bride be outside? The church is the bride of Christ. So here we're talking about children of the kingdom. The ten virgins would be children of the kingdom, unsaved Jewish people during the time of the millennium, or during the time of the rapture, during the time of also the millennium. Because they're the children of the kingdom, children of the Jewish kingdom. So those ten virgins are not the bride. The bride's in the church with the bridegroom. You gotta understand that. So if you read that, you know, well, it's talking about the saved and unsaved. Well, didn't he know who his wives were? And all of a sudden, you know, he's marrying ten women. Why is he doing that? Why are now five all of a sudden come in? Can't the bridegroom walk to the door, peek out, and say, Well, I know those five too. Let them in. He's marrying them after all. No, he's not marrying them. These are attendants. Does that make sense? But see what people try to do, tell you all the time. I got it all the time when I was in high school, because I'm trying to figure this out. Well, you know, some were saved, some weren't. No. Okay, let's all back up to that. Yes, some were saved, or some weren't. We, we'll, get, we'll go ahead and go with that. Uh, but however, they're not the bride. Those would be people who were saved during the tribulation, probably. Uh, do people get saved during the millennium? That's going to be another question for another time. All right, let's look at Matthew 25. Let's pick it up in verse 31. One of the, oh, we got to go quick. Okay, that's that again. Okay. Okay, Matthew 25, you're going to have to flip there. I don't have it up here. And if you don't, that's fine. Just listen. This is, this will confuse more people. And they'll think that they have to, you have to have a prison ministry in order to be saved. You have to visit the poor in order to be saved. Why? Because of Matthew 25 and not understanding the kingdom of heaven. Should we visit the poor? Yes. Should we feed people? Yes. Does it get us to heaven? No. All right. Let's figure out Matthew 25. I'll read as you listen. And we're going to read 15 verses. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall gather all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divided the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. So he's going to take all nations and separate them. Sheep, goats. And I'm not even thinking whether they're on the right and left here right now. I'm just, you know, sheep and goat. Sheep, goat. I did have a right. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, them, the sheep, Come, ye blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What kingdom? The kingdom of heaven. Let's go backwards here for a second. We don't want to have that. Let's go backwards for a second. Okay. So Matthew 24. What's going on right here is the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation is a war. I mean, if we were to sum it up, a lot of people are going to be suffering. But the premise of the Great Tribulation is Satan versus Israel. Pretty much. It's the Antichrist. It, it's going to be converging. It's going to be breaking treaties. And it's just going to be back and forth. You know, God fighting in there, throwing in some side, you know, things that, you know, some things are going to be happening here. It's all about Israel. Now, there's going to be some collateral damage. And so what's going to be happening during this time is other nations are going to be taking in the Jews. Jews are going to be fleeing. Because remember, Jesus said, flee. If you're anywhere near this area, flee. Because you know what? Everybody here is going to die. Remember, that won't be us because we won't be here. Saved will not be here at all. We're going to be raptured out here. So Jews here are going to be scattered. And some nations are going to take them in. Some nations are going to push them away. So let's say Egypt takes them in. Then they would be a sheep nation. Turkey turns them away. Now make Turkey a goat nation. Does that make sense? 
At this point, when Armageddon happens, understand that there's not one saved person on the planet. Y'all got that? The rapture happens here, so the church is gone. People will get saved during this time, but however, they're going to be pulled out in the gleanings. Remember, thrust in thy sickle, gathered from the four winds of heaven. And so people get confused by that and think that's talking about the rapture of the church, but it isn't. Some of the people get saved during the tribulation. And the two witnesses get pulled out then too. And immediately Christ is coming back, Armageddon, right there. And so people are going to survive Armageddon. You know, not, it's not even an issue. Okay. Let's go back to verse 34. Matthew 25, 34. Then the king shall say to them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hunger, and he gave me meat. I was thirsty, and he gave me drink. I was a stranger, and he took me in. Naked, and he clothed me. I was sick, and he visited me. I was in prison, and he came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thought, saw we then a hunger, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, and in, or in prison, and come unto thee? And the king shall answer and say to them, Verily I say unto thee, Inasmuch as ye done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, are we Christ's brethren? No, we're sons, we're daughters. We are the sons of God, right? So we're sons, we're not brothers. Who's Christ's brothers? Jews. So the Jews that are getting hammered right here during this three and a half, people taking them in, are now these people. So these people are standing before this judgment, Matthew 25, not one of them is saved. Not one of them. But because their nation took in Jews, they get to walk alive into the millennium. We will already have our spiritual bodies. We're going to rule and reign with Christ, right? So if we're ruling and reigning with Christ, but nobody there is sinful, what are we ruling and reigning for? There's nothing to rule and reign over. In heaven, there won't be a ruling class. In the millennium, there will be. And we will be it. You know, hey, you've done been faithful over 60 things here. Be faithful, you know, rule over 60 cities. Of what? Other people that are in the millennium? <laughs> Does that mean I'm going to rule over, you know, him, and then I have to deal with, you know, somebody ruling over me? No. Christ will rule over us. We will rule over cities. And so it makes perfect sense when we look at it like this. But remember, at this judgment, not one person is saved. So the people that get to walk into the kingdom, I'm doing this past. So we'll go. All right, verse 41. Then shall he say to them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devils and his angels. For I was a hungered, and he gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and he gave me no drink. For I was a stranger, he took me in. Naked, and he clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and he visited me not. Notice the people who did these things didn't even know they did them. All they did is took in the Jews. Then shall they answer, and so they'll ask, and verse 45, Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, As much as you did it, or did it not one of the least of these, you did it not unto me. And he shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. And you're saying, hey, it says eternal there. I'm sorry, it's still just talking about the millennium. I don't, I don't have an answer for that last word. Uh, I can study a little bit further. Uh, but, so what you see there is not one person saved in this judgment. The sheep and goat nations, not one person saved. But those people that are sheep nations get to walk into the middle. Because if you look over here, when Satan is let out of his prison here at the end of the millennium and in the thousand years, remember, there's war. Battle of Gog and Magog. I asked somebody in high school, and what's I'm reading, I'm like, what's this Battle of Gog and Magog? This is after the millennium. There shouldn't be any, how's this happening? And am I going to be involved? What if I'm one of those that turns against Christ? <laughs> he looked at me and said, well, I hope we just have to hope or not. <laughs> if you don't know the answer, just say, I don't know. Uh, but what happens here at the end of Battle of Gog and Magog is all these people, because we're not going to reproduce in the millennium, but you know who will? The sheep nations right here will reproduce for a thousand years under great conditions. And you know what? There's going to be a lot of kids born, a lot of people born. And you know what? Satan's going to be let loose, Battle of Gog and Magog, and a good portion of them are going to turn against Christ and try to fight him. And Jesus is going to say, yeah, you're done. They're all going to die. So you're going to look like you're saved over here in the judgment of sheep and goat nations. Remember, the goat nations die here and go to hell because they're not saved. The people over here that die still go to hell because they're not saved either. Imagine living on earth with Christ and not getting saved. Talk about dumb. But that, see, that's the way the whole Bible works. All the way back, all the way to here, it's a new thing, but the humans still figure out a way to fail every time. <coughs> all right. 
And then there's other comparisons on here. We'll skip them. But I hope you got it. Any questions? We'll skip all this to make the comparisons just to prove the point, but I think we'll prove it. I got a question. Go ahead. You're talking about the kingdom of the Jews? Yes. Is that based on the original 12 family? I think so. Okay. Yeah, it was, it's interesting. I've talked on this before. Is you, know, you have no group of people that has maintained their bloodline and maintained their identity like the Jews have. Right. Um, now, how they you know can trace them back to more than just Judah and Benjamin, I don't know. But apparently some can. I don't know. But yes, that's my understanding. Because then there's going to be some popping up at the end. I talked about it this Sunday. Uh, Jesus said, you know, the synagogue of Satan are those who claim they're Jews but are not. Now, that's going to be interesting. Who's that talking about? I don't answer for that. Congratulations. You've endured to the end. You made it to the end of the sermon. And I'm proud of you. Hey, my number's at the bottom of the screen here. Text me if you need anything. I hope to see you here sometime. Have a great day.